Um, I want to introduce myself. I know that there are a number of familiar faces in here, and there's also a number of folks who I have yet to meet, and um, I'm super excited to meet you guys. My name is Crystal, and I'm one of the pastors here with NLCF. Um, Last week, you met Robbie, if you were here. Actually, this week as well. He's this guy, like... That's Robbie. Um, Hi, I'm Robbie. Um, But uh, he he taught last week, and um, so if you if you heard from him, you met a little bit of our family as well. But if you were not here, if this is your very first Sunday, um, I want to introduce you a little bit to my family. Um, So this is Robbie. Sorry, it's a little cloudy. On the right is Roslyn, the one who's holding the oar up. And then, ugh, that cutie in the middle. That's Lucy. Um, This is a picture from where we spend our summers, where we have over the last couple years up in the Adirondacks of New York. Um, We were there for a leadership training program. And so if this image incites you, um, let us tell you a little bit more about leadership training, okay? Mark it on your Connect card. Not a shameless plug, just a genuine sense of, hey, it's awesome. Um... But that being said, he's just a good guy. They're good people, good to be around, all right? Sorry, I forgot to start my timer. Just, I want to honor your guys' time, so we're doing that. Um, So a little bit more about myself. I was sitting right where you guys are for the very first time about 16 years ago. There it is. I just came out and said it, okay? Um. And at that time, God used this guy named Daniel that we're talking about now. He used Daniel to resonate so deeply in me to what I had been asking and seeking God for coming into college. This question that just kept bouncing around in my head, how do I pursue a deep and fruit-bearing relationship with God when what I felt like when I looked around... uh, the culture around me was just running in the opposite direction. How do I lovingly tell my hallmates or my coworkers that I like them and I want to spend time with them, just maybe not in what they're doing? How do I actually gain territory in my faith when I'm being pulled in different directions by my parents and my friends and my professors and my boss and cultural expectations? How do I get back up on my feet in pursuing God when I've lost sight and I've lashed out in anger. I cheated on a test. I'm deep in despair. I made an inappropriate comment that now somebody else is carrying with them. That I got caught up in the party scene when my heart told me this is not where you should be or even shared intimate moments before it was glorifying to God. How do I remain faithful to God when it's so easy to not? So let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to talk about this king of all the earth, looking a little bit more at Daniel. Let's pray. Father, in all things, may you be glorified. Lord, even now that our hearts and our minds and our our bodies would be stilled, and that our spirit would be awakened to your word, Lord, my prayer for this has been really that you would just give us ears to hear. You will take care of what it looks like to follow. But God, even just in these words, would you help us to hear from you? Speak to our hearts. Speak to our understanding. Speak to our eyes and our minds. We are here, Lord. We are present speak. Amen. So today we're going to continue in our Daniel series. Um, If you do have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go ahead and get it out. We're going to actually be bouncing around a little bit this morning, um, spending a lot of time in the Word. If you don't have a Bible or you don't have a Bible app, it is going to be up on the screen, and that might be just as helpful because we're going to be um, all the way from the middle of the Bible to New Testament to Old, Old Testament, all right? Um, so this morning we're starting out in Daniel chapters four and five, 
And in these two chapters, we get this description of the end of the, the lives of two Babylonian kings. Um, the father, who's King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the one who we've been talking about up to this point, right? Um, over the last few weeks and all the different scenarios with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all that kind of stuff, that has been Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter 5, we're going to talk about Belshazzar. This is not to be confused with Belteshazzar, who was actually Daniel. I know it's a little bit confusing, but Belshazzar. All right, now we're squared away. So last week when Robbie was teaching, we saw um, that Nebuchadnezzar decreed that nobody should speak against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, right? We're seeing already that there are these moments that Nebuchadnezzar has been confronted with where he's recognizing the powerful and might of God. He's recognizing that, as he says, no other God can save this way. And so he doesn't say, you need to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what he does say is, you cannot speak against this God, okay? So there's a little bit of a softening there, but we still have some room to grow. So here in chapters 4 and 5, we have these two kings who ultimately become filled with pride because of their imperial power. So when we open up uh, chapter 4, it starts with this letter that Nebuchadnezzar writes to his kingdom, um, describing this interaction, this dream that he had. When we get into Daniel, I want to say like, oh, everything up to this point has kind of been real life. I'm sorry, I don't know that a fourth person in a fiery furnace is necessarily what I would feel like, hey, no problem, real life. But now we're starting to get into some of the dreams, some of the visions, all that kind of stuff. So um, a little bit more of of what's happening behind the scenes that's not quite as visual. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and only Daniel was able to interpret it, all right? Nebuchadnezzar's dream was this thing where he saw this big, giant, tall, flourishing tree in the middle of a field. Kind of feels like a little bit of that mustard tree scenario, But there's this beautiful tree that is a safe haven for all the things around it, right? And then this voice from heaven speaks, and he says, cut down the tree, take off all the limbs, strip away all the leaves, make it bare, cut it down, but leave the stump, and bind it, because the stump is meant to be something that is covered with dew. It's it's kind of this image of, it it becomes this wild thing. It's amidst the grazing of the cattle, um, and it just, it remains there growing wild, becoming forgotten, okay? And so when Daniel interprets this, he implores King Nebuchadnezzar to humble himself before God and before God's kingdom because he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. You are that tree. He says in chapter 4, verse 25, He says, acknowledge that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and he gives them to anyone that he wishes. In 26, he says that the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that that kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge heaven rules. So Daniel tells him, renounce your sins, and here's what that looks like. Do what is right. Be kind to the oppressed. It's what he needed to do, but he didn't. Nebuchadnezzar resisted, and not 12 months later, a whole year, we see have this picture of Nebuchadnezzar walking on the roof of the royal palace, and what he says is this in verse 30. He looks out and he says, Is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my power my, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. And so no sooner did these words leave his mouth that he heard a voice from heaven, a messenger stripping him of his royal authority and driving him away from people to be one who eats grass like the cattle, to be unclean and unkept like a wild animal. So we fast forward to his son Belshazzar, right, in verse, chapter 5. Belshazzar is hosting a drunken party for thousands of people, and it's kind of this um, celebration of all of 
his pride and what he's built. And he uses these items that are sacred to God's temple. That alone, not okay. He's defiling the temple. He's dishonoring God. And then he went on to praise the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Talk about establishing some idols and giving credit to where credit is not due, right? When he does that, this mysterious hand appears and it writes on the wall. I imagine it looked a little bit more like this. In Hebrew, mysterious, kind of you don't know the origin of this hand. Um, I don't think it looked like this. Kind of that, like, that, th- that thumb just is just right in your face. Hand cut off, I don't know. So I think it was probably a little bit more like that. But what that hand wrote on the wall was the laying out of the judgment that had been placed on Belshazzar because of where his prideful and idolatrous heart had led him. So Daniel, again, was the only one who was able to interpret the message on the wall, and he says to Belshazzar, he says, you know what happened to your dad. You know the dream that he had and how it came to fruition because he was unwilling to humble himself and acknowledge that it is the most high God who is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. Daniel recalls to Belshazzar in verse 20, he says, when Nebuchadnezzar's heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory like that tree. And then he turns to Belshazzar and he says, but you, his son, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. And Belshazzar's life ended that night. Kind of tough for these two guys, right? When we read about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the thing of kingship, the thing of having authority over these animals, and then in the lack of humility, that being reverted. There's something in those pieces that ought to jog our minds back to Genesis 1 and 2 a little bit where humanity is created and given authority. So King David says it like this. King David has the right perspective on what this ought to look like. He talks about it in Psalm 8, starting in verse 3. He says, he's talking to God here, he said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set into place, what is man? that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. He's saying, of all the things that you've created, these magnificent pieces of your glory, what is mankind? What is humanity? And yet, you have made them a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned them with glory and honor. God, you made them rulers over the works of your hands, And you put everything under their feet, all the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the sea. See, humans were created to be the royal image bearers of God, given authority to rule over the beasts, the beasts, the beasts, the beasts, those things. They're not yet here yet. We're still waiting on them to be created. The beasts and the birds, all right, on behalf of God. But when human kingdoms forget that and rebel and turn themselves into God, they become less than human. They become like beasts. They become like Nebuchadnezzar. So when we are disposed, removed from this place of what God intended for us, what erupts in us is We respond with aggression. We try to take what isn't ours. We get caught up in selfishness. We misuse or abuse resources, whether that be from the earth, monetarily, or people. When we are beasts, we redefine what is right and what is wrong in order to tip the scales for our own advantage. When we allow our pride and idolatry to remain positioned above God, glorifying our own power and choosing to not to acknowledge him as the giver of all things life, 
we lose what makes us human. The capacity to be loved and to be known and the ability to give that to others. Because we are so consumed with amassing our own fame, we exchange the opportunity to be satisfied in our deepest longings for momentary glory. Paul describes what happens beneath our surface in his letter to the Romans. So if you're looking at Romans chapter 1, we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. But starting in verse 18, it says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their own wickedness. Basically saying, God is entering in and saying, I'm, I'm not done with this. I'm done with this. You want to have it your way? Okay. Here's what you're wanting. Because since what, what may be known about God is plain to them, because why? God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This reality that when we look around us, when we look at creation, when we look at the life cycle of a plant, when we look at how gravity works or how these stars and moons, moons, seriously y'all, how they illuminate the nights, how can we not be drawn in recognition that God is creator? that he is the one who set all these things into motion. And what he's kind of saying is what Daniel said to Belshazzar. He said, you know the story, and you've seen it with your own eyes, and yet you still do not acknowledge God. Paul continues, he said, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Sounds a little bit like our king's. That although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart. Picking up a little bit later, it says, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to their depraved mind to do what ought not be done, and they have become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. God is not out to instill these things in people or to punish them even. He has been faithful to pursue us. The God that we seek and serve is a God who will fight for us, who will stand with us as we try to avoid and to flee from these things. But he is unwilling to strong arm us into humbling ourselves. And so when we ask and ask and ask, God, I want this for myself. I want my name to be great. I want people to recognize me. And I want to be the one who is the name shining in lights. He says, okay. Okay. You don't know what you're asking for. But here you go. Here's the stuff I was trying to keep from you. And that is what our unwillingness to humble ourselves before God produces over time. These things that emerge in our hearts. But this God that Daniel worshipped, this God that we worship, he is the king who restores humanity. Part of why Belshazzar's pride is so hard to witness in Daniel chapter 5 is because while he knew how God had warmed Nebuchadnezzar, he also knew how this story ended. So if we're to go back to Daniel chapter 4, and we're going to read this from the message, starting in verse 34, he says, this is Nebuchadnezzar, he said, and at the end of seven years, so he'd become beast-like, he had grazed, he'd been forgotten, um, his nails were untrimmed, it became like claws, it says, kind of gross. At the end of seven years, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I looked to heaven. And I was given back my mind, and I blessed the high God, thanking and glorifying God who lives forever. And this is how we see Nebuchadnezzar humbling himself. He says that his sovereign rule lasts and lasts, and his kingdom never declines and fails. 
life on this earth doesn't add up to much, but God's heavenly army keeps everything going. No one can interrupt his work, and no one can call his rule into question. And at the same time, I was given back my mind. I was also given back my majesty and splendor, making my kingdom shine. All the leaders and important people, they came looking for me, which I'm kind of like, all right, guys, took seven years for you to find him. Okay. But they came looking for him nonetheless, and, and I was reestablished as king in my kingdom and became greater than ever. And this is why I'm singing. I, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm singing and praising the king of heaven that everything he does is right, and he does it the right way. He knows how to turn a proud person into a humble man or woman. See, we're not trapped. We're not trapped by the darkness of our sinful nature. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord that there is hope in this reality. That in this sinful and idol-seeking state, that when we humble ourselves, we are restored to our true forms. The most authentic version of ourselves that we could ever know. And this is good news to us. To know it is the most right place for our desires to be in the hands of the eternal kingdom and the one God who rules over it. Because even the stirring, even the stirring that we feel of spiritual desire indicates that God's spirit is already at work within us, drawing us to himself, that we can take hope that even the inclination that we feel towards God is not something that we're just simply trying to conjure up, attempting to stir up this desire for himself, and then hoping upon hope that he will honor our desire as we come to him. But in reality, our humbling ourselves before the Lord is almost this pulling back of the curtain of our hearts and our minds in order to reveal the truth that God is already here. That we love because God first loved us. We long for God because he first longed for us. We reach out for God because he first reached out for us. Nothing in the spiritual life originates with us. It all originates with God. I think that cuts off a lot of the road I feel like I have to tread in order to get to him. We can humble ourselves because like Daniel, who took heart and trusted God's faithfulness, God's kingdom will never end and it will never be destroyed. And that means rather than being consumed with amassing our own fame, which will inevitably wane, right? Our lives lived for the glory of God will push back on sin in order to make way for the kingdom of God to break through to a world where it is God's every intention and every desire that it would be reconciled back to himself. Our humbling will draw others toward Christ in salvation. It'll draw others to freedom from the burden that idolatry binds us with. But God as king is not just one who hovers over the earth ruling. He, or this king who shows up only if we're in some position of significant influence. He's not distant and impersonal. But his heart breaks over all of our sin because we are created. He made us in a way that we would be in relationship with him. Loved by him. Known by him. And we may have even heard that God hates our sin, not just because he's holy, which just basically means that it is pure and set apart, which will keep us at a distance from this relationship with God when we're unwilling to let go of our pride. But God hates our sin because he knows what idolatry will produce in us. And his love for us runs way too deep. To let us remain lost in ourselves. But it is up to us to turn to him. 
I'm a mess, y'all. I fully accept that. You're a mess too. And we got to own that. We have to own this reality that we do not have it all together, that we are not standing where we are because of the greatness that just seeps out from anything that we do. But we can't also let that own us. We can't be claimed and and taking on this identity that I'm a mess, I can't do it, it's never going to be enough. Because the reality is, is that these desires for ourselves, for our own prestige, for our own glory, these desires, they lurk in all of us. Look around the room. What you're struggling with, what you're wrestling with, this pride that you feel or this false pride, every other person is feeling the tug of that as well. The desires lurk within all of us. Their power only gets stronger the longer that we repress them. So how much safer is it for ourselves and everyone around us if we open up our desires in Jesus' presence and we allow him to enter into that to help us sift through those things that we long for? We would be wise to heed the same word that God gave Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar to humble ourselves before God. We tend to think like Nebuchadnezzar, right? This kind of thing of, okay, let's acknowledge him. Let's not speak bad things about this God. But there are still things that I'm pretty great at. We tend to think like Nebuchadnezzar, but Jesus is our model. When we're walking in faith, when we're walking in the life of the church, Jesus is our model. And Jesus, even he humbled himself before God. And what he did is he then let God raise him up to be exalted. Our response is not hard in nature, right? Acknowledge God. Invite him to be the master of our lives. But it must be complete. And so that's where we're confronted with some of these tough decisions. But God is in it for the long haul, if we are too. So what do we do? What do we do in, in just the seeking of keeping faithfulness out in front of us? In, with the Lord's help, keeping our humanity intact. What do we do? I think it begins with this question. If I'm not broken over my sin, why is that? This isn't a guilt trip by any means, but this is just a recognition of if I'm not bothered by how quick I am to be impatient or angry, if I'm not bothered by the fact that I'm living a life that is not glorifying to God, why is that? It could be apathy, it could be pride, it could be any number of things. But it starts here. And this is an honest question really for us to take before the Lord. For us to say, God, would you do some seeking in my heart and in my mind as to where I actually am standing with you? And then whatever comes from that, just a couple things that we would would do to live in this life of faithfulness. I think first, we practice confession. Confession is the place where we are met with God's forgiveness and healing. Confession, and I know it's one of those things that's like, I feel awkward or uncomfortable or embarrassed to kind of just lay it all out. You can start with the Lord. But for most of us in here, this is not a regular thing that we do. God already knows. He already knows. So that's kind of helpful to kind of break down. So a lot of the barrier that we feel is likely because it's on us, but he's going to receive us. So we come to him in confession, and we're met with his goodness. In confession, share regularly with the Lord or with somebody around you when you recognize that you're seeking for yourself, when you're having a hard time just letting go of this desire to gain glory 
for you. Confess the parts that are hard to, to pursue humility in. This thing of, well, I am actually pretty good at this. Or it feels good that my name is the one that's called out to be known for this. Confess that it's hard. Confess when you grow more impatient with being inconvenienced. And seek counsel frequently. There is a a monk that in the 13, 1400s, who his job in the monastery was to um, kind of give this crash course to new monks of what it looks like to pursue God. His name is Thomas Akempis. And um, in this book that he wrote, he was talking about this aspect of confession. And it is one thing for us to muster up enough courage to be plain with somebody and to share our hearts um, with somebody and our, our sin. But it's also something when we are the person who people come to. And so this is a little bit of instruction here. He says that when someone else is tempted and comes to you and confesses, do not treat them harshly. But on the contrary, console and encourage him. Show him the same kindness that you yourself would like to receive. So we confess. Secondly, we engage worship as a daily discipline. Worship realigns our rightful position with God. Worship claims that he is the one who is worthy of all the praise, and we are the ones who get to give it. Worship is a time that we offer ourselves and our talents and our knowledge back to the Lord as this proclamation that really it was all his to begin with, to do with it as he sees fit. And this isn't just a thing of make sure you're singing your heart out any time of the day. Worship can become a lot of practices. In a couple weeks, we're actually going to do a whole series um, on worship. So stick around for that. Um, But worship is the place where we develop dependence on God for anything significant to happen and where our obedient response to the kingship of God is cultivated. Worship is the place where we develop dependence on God for anything significant to happen and where our obedient response to the kingship of God is cultivated. And then lastly, in response, to share the story of God with others. That that would be a regular part of what we do. Because nothing is going to remind us of how amazing God is and all that he's done in our lives than telling people about it more and more and more. Considering this question, what has God done in your life? What if a story can you share with others that would tell of his work that's in you and through you, having nothing to do with something that you did yourself? Sharing the story of God with others is proclaiming that God is sovereign, that he is over all and in all and through all. And I don't know about you guys, but I need to hear that just as much as the people who don't know God yet. It is this thing that we walk in, but the reality is, is that God doesn't leave us in this alone. He's not saying, okay, well, once you come and are in a good space of humility, then we can talk. He's saying, I'm with you. I will help you. I know what it looks like. I know your heart. I know what it requires for you to be humble and to live in humility. Let me help you. Because God is not just this God that is in front of us waiting for us. God is, in fact, our shield. God is the one who blazes the trail in front of us in order to make a way for us to be humble. God is also our guide, revealing and bringing to mind the things that we need to confess to him. And God is our foundation. He is the thing who has our back every step of the way. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful that you know us. I'm thankful, Lord, that you recognize that our minds and our hearts, that we are a people who are made for wanting and wanting good. 
But Lord, at times we get confused and conflicted and we get sidetracked on what good actually is. So Father, I pray that you would realign our vision. I pray, God, that you would be our help, that you would be our hope, that you, God, would be just this voice that continues to encourage us along the way. And Lord, that as I prayed at the beginning, Lord, that we would have ears to hear. We thank you, God, that you did not just leave us to be lost in ourselves, but continually and faithfully, you who are king over all, you call us to yourself, that we might be restored to the true sense of who you made us to be. God, help us to understand that. And give us courage, God, if we don't understand it, that we wouldn't be embarrassed to just talk to somebody about it. Believing, Lord, that you can break through and that you want to. So God, we are yours and yours alone. And we praise you today. Amen.